<laughs> we leave pra Prague Castle before dawn. A score of guards escort us and other alchemists. For our safety, why are there so many monsters in the world? Dawn creeps over the... Well, what? Vitala? <laughs> Finally, we arrive at the house of the last alchemist. We will soon be home. No, no, no. Papa will not stop talking to him. I walk into the alley next to the man's house. Two steps into it, and ouch, I bump into an invisible wall. White eyes appear in the darkness. I see it. The silhouette of a giant. Marks cover the monster's pitch black forehead. No letters. I met. I stare at the white eyes. What are you? I have been called many names. The monster's voice is strange, guttural. Here, they call me Golem. Papa shouts, Guards, run toward us! You have just saved your father's life, little one. It rasps. Golem runs toward the river. It's I see it clearly now, a gigantic body, black and sinewy. The monster jumps in the river. I follow Papa and the guards behind me. I observe the water, perfectly still. Not a hint of golem. And just scrolling back up. Ooh. <coughs> Ghosts. Ooh. We have never discussed Papa's imprisonment. Not one word about it in over three years. Now that John Francis is away, I must... I alone must care for Mama. Papa will, Papa will be released from prison today, but Mama worries. She says that he has one last chance to satisfy the Emperor's expectations. Standing in front of the house, I hold Mama's hand. My heart beats quickly as I behold Ma Papa's carriage. I forget to breathe when it stops two paces before us. Mama trembles when the carriage door opens. A pale, emaciated man with a long, grizzled beard steps out. Papa, he walks by us as if we were ghosts. Mama has prepared roasted lamb, Papa's favorite, to celebrate his return, but he does not eat. He simply stares at his plate, silent. Mama makes idle conversation, pretending without much success that nothing is wrong. Papa suddenly stands up. His chair hits the floor with a thou loud thought. <laughs> Papa storms out of the living room, pushing invisible spirits out of his way. He shouts in a strange tongue the same language I once heard him speak when I was little. My heart is in a knot, but I hold back my tears. I take Mama's hand, but nothing I can do or say will ease her sorrow. What will we do now? Oh dear. The Emperor has restored Papa's status, but soldiers guard our house. They are not here to protect us, but to make sure Papa does not leave Prague. A month has passed since Papa's return. He remains distant, but at least he does not completely ignore us, though he works ceaselessly. Um, <coughs> I walk through the open door of Papa's study, the platter Mama has prepared for him in my hands, and stop. Papa sits on the floor and begins to howl. I drop the platter and its contents and its content splatters across the room. I run to Papa and kneel next to him. He grasps my hand and immediately falls silent. Papa's nails dig into the flesh of my hand. I bite my lip to suppress a cry. He suddenly raises a tight fist in front of my face. I close my eyes. I cannot do it. Papa's voice is bleak, desperate. Not enough. Not, a, not even a handful left. I look at him. Tears run down his ashen face. Slowly, as if revealing a priceless treasure, he opens his fist. In the palm of his wrinkled hand is a tiny bit of red dust. Curse you, D. Papa works without rest, even though he keeps saying he has already failed us. He has not slept in weeks and he barely eats, but he is but a shell of the man I once knew. Mama shakes me out of my dreams. Elizabeth, soldiers are coming. I do not react immediately, for I'm used to soldiers guarding our house. I look outside. There is a column of young men in uniform in our yard. Their torches cast dancing shadows upon their faces. 
Monsters of Prague. I open the front door. An officer and six stern-faced men step inside. The officer's clear officer clears his throat. By order of... No, Mama darts forward, tears streaming down her cheeks. I hold her back. You cannot take him away. You cannot. Not again. The soldier's eyes widen. Papa walks toward us, his face twisted in a demonic grimace. Grim <laughs> grimace. <laughs> he murmurs a prayer in the strange tongue of only, only he seems to understand. Seriously, the more I read, the more I deteriorate. <laughs> okay. The officer tries to reason with Papa. Howling, Papa jumps on him, clawing at his face. The soldier strikes his head and he falls. Mama wails as they take him away. I am 16 years old and some of the guards in... Oh my god. <laughs> Nevin? Nevin? Is, is H silent? Naveen? <laughs> Castle have taken an, an interest in me. They insist on making conversation every time I visit Papa. None of them interest me. Most are boorish cretins. Others are more bedraggled than hogs in mud-filled styes. But I always smile and remain courteous. I take a deep breath when, in the distance, I spot Nevin's, Naveen's tower. <laughs> Honestly, I, I am not very familiar with the accents on vowels, so I'm not really sure if that's supposed to be an I or an E or a, you know, anyway. I try not to think of the babbling louse I will have to confront before seeing Papa. What is this? Across at the top of the tower, I walk more briskly, then my heart stops. Papa! He stands on the edge of the tower, arms wide open. I run toward the castle. I see Papa clearly now, a skeleton in his tattered robes. He stares at me. No, not at me, but beyond. You have come. Free me, divine messenger. Free me. Papa raises his hands to the sky as if praying. Heavenly guardian, guide my fall. He jumps off the tower. I support Papa's broken body. He bleeds profusely, but holds my gaze. His demons no longer haunt him. D was wise. He exhales his last breath. News of Queen Elizabeth's death. <laughs> News of Queen <laughs> Elizabeth's death reaches Prague. Prague. Le Hague. The Virgin Queen, after which I have been named, has passed away one month after my wedding. A knock at the door disturbs my thoughts. I lift my head from the blank page on my desk and put down my quill put put my quill down. Well I guess it works either way. Come in Jo okay, Johans? Is that how that's supposed to be pronounced? <laughs> my husband steps into my study. A tussock of raven hair brushes his face as he lowers his head. How remarkably formal of him. He apologizes for disturbing me while I work. I frown, feigning annoyance, but fail to suppress a thin smile. I seem incapable of writing today. Johan's face <laughs> lights up. His thumb absently caresses the ivory handle of his cane. The package has arrived. It is addressed to Lady Beth. Lady Beth? Only Uncle John calls me thus. I have not heard from him in years. I rush out the window. Oh my god, how did I read window? Run out of the room and hurry down the stairs as I used to when I was little. Ignoring the letter accompanying the package, I quickly peel off the layers of cloth covering what I assume to be a framed painting. The painting depicts the Virgin Queen, two ladies in waiting behind her, and standing in front of three goddesses. Oh boy. How thoughtful of Uncle John. Johans and I stare at the painting, mesmerized. Magnificent, my eyes then fixate on the verse engraved upon its frame. Johans contemplates every last detail, every tiny stroke, every subtle hue. Master Johans Leo, husband, jurist, and connoisseur. See what lies on the ground. Johannes points a finger first at a golden scepter, then at a quiver of arrows, and finally at fallen roses. Juno, Minerva, and Venus. 
Joanne sh shakes his head, laughing quietly. He had not expected me to answer. He should know better. Or Hera, Athena, and Aphrodite. Johannes knows... Johannes's nose is two inches from the painting. Come on, guys. Proofread! Proofread! Um, the three goddesses whose beauty Paris judged. <clears throat> I remember the story well, having read it several times. This painting is an allegory, my husband says. I suspect otherwise but do not contradict him. There is something familiar about the painting. Is this? Yes, the golden orb, identical <laughs> to the one I found in Uncle John's room when I was a child. I sit in my study alone, staring at the painting Uncle John has given me. My hands tremble as my fingers brush the edge of the dry wax, sealing his scroll. I carefully break the scroll seal and unroll it. I immediately recognize Uncle John's penmanship. Lady Beth begins. I smile, for I am still fond of the private name. Uncle John used to address me. Fairest and most noble of poetesses. <laughs> uh -huh. Please accept this humble gift from your not-so-humble friend and mentor. Uncle John is much more than that. He is family, a second father to me. I hope you will find it a fitting tribute for your betrothal. I laughed quietly. I had never expected to receive such a splendid gift. If you observe the composition, you will surely recognize the trinket you once unearthed in my chamber. The golden orb. I knew it. You may think this picture a riddle, an allegory, an artist's fancy. It is not. The object in the hand of the fairy queen is real. So is its power, and so are the goddesses. Hmm. We. That was really long. I don't know how long I spent reading, but I was pretty much deteriorating at the end there, as you could tell. I was like, okay, okay, I want to stop reading now. Hopefully this isn't anything I have to read. <laughs> if it is, I honestly think I'm just going to silently read it to myself because... Um, okay, so do I want... Alright, so rotate... Ah, that's why I was... Okay. Ah, uh, okay, so if I do this... Shoot! Maybe if I... Shoot, that's not what I wanted to do. Well... No. Maybe if I do this... seems like, uh... We'll try this. No. What the heck? That's not what that thing was... Hmm. It's just guessing here, so yeah. <sighs> um, no, that's not what I meant to do. All right, let's see here. If I, where do I want to get to? I want to get to there, I think. And to get there, I need to get there. To get there, I. No, I must... Maybe I want to get here. Ah! This is... Okay, so I want to get to that little vortex thingy. But Barbara, that little... Okay. So I want to get... But how? There. 
then if I do... Ah, shit. Initial reports gave us hope that Enzio Auditori would serve as an ideal candidate for future Abstergo projects. His charisma, sexual magnetism, and wry humor gave him all the qualities of a leading man. However, his corruption by the Assassin Order robbed him of these qualities as he fell deeper and deeper into a spiral of revenge. Enzio was frequently known to articulate a passive acceptance of evil. He was also a man of ugly contradictions, one who preached free thought, yet traveled well beyond his home country to proselytize his corrupted creed, just as he's doing here with this impressionable Chinese girl. Notice, too, that in his gestures and bearing, there is still something of the old lecher in him. Enzio's entire personality is built around pure demagoguery, claiming his philosophy is about love when violence and coercion are his primary means of tackling problems. We have therefore come to the conclusion that Enzio Auditori da Firenze would be a risky character to develop. Oh, jeez. <sighs> can at least say his name properly. <laughs> um, and we... Yeah, I don't... Well, actually, wait, didn't this room maybe have a extra one in there? Yes! My memory serves me at times. <laughs> ah, lovely. Okay, this is gonna be a really high number. So we'll start with all... Oh, wait. Whoa! 
Oh, that's really high. Okay. Okay. Um, maybe this... Whoa! I... Could... I, I keep doing these things by accident. And more hacking, okay. Oh, right. Arrow keys, not WASD. I was like, why am I not going? No, oh, shit! I forgot that thing goes red. So I kind of panicked and failed and... Alright. Ow! Ah! Here we go again. I did it! No! <laughs> I know I should have waited for the... Ah! I'm all... No! I did it again! Uh. Ah! Alright, I'll wait for the bigger gap. Oh shit. And now I'm just not... okay. There we go. <sighs> Our initial research into the life of Ratana Gaiden focused on a period spanning his late teens to his early 30s. But our researchers came away unimpressed by his calm and stoic demeanor, with occasional flashes of extreme anger. This was not the sort of leading man we felt comfortable endorsing. We decided, therefore, to delve into his early childhood.